Welcome to MMB Air Gun Review. I got an exciting video for you today. At least it's exciting to me because I actually had a chance yesterday to go out and put a few hundred rounds through the Sig Sauer MPX. And what I have discovered is that this thing has top-notch quality. This particular one does anyhow. And it excited me. It's not often you get to take a gun out and you have something function flawlessly and this was flawless and this was done in conditions that were kind of extreme. So, I'll give you a little history. The gun came, I was impressed with the looks and the aesthetics and the feel of the gun right off the bat. So I decided that I didn't order any 88 gram canisters or 90 gram because I don't, they're a waste to me because I don't store guns with those canisters on or any CO2 or gas on a gun. Um, I don't do it for maintenance purposes. I don't want to have to come back to that gun a month, two months later to find that I need to service it because CO2 was left in the gun. I simply don't do it. A lot of people do it. They don't have issues. I don't. I've had bad luck with it. So I like to store my guns empty unless it's a HPA. Then, uh, then I don't mind storing it with air in it. But CO2 on seals kind of has an effect on them over time, so I just don't do it. So that being said, what I did is I wanted a 12 gram adapter. Not a 24 gram adapter that takes the two. I have had bad luck with those. They don't seem to have the power. They seem to leak every one I've used. So I stayed away from that until they perfected a little bit and I went to just a single. I got this one from Amazon. And this particular one run me about $26, but it's labeled to fit the MCX and, M and MPX. And as many of you know, if you've bought these before, sometimes they don't fit. And you've got to do some modifications to make them fit, and that's not fun. So make sure you get one that just screws right in, even if it's a few bucks more, because it's worth it for the headache. You know, you save yourself a lot of headache. Now this particular one's very nice. It does This one doesn't have the hole in the side. What you do is you actually see the CO2 in the back, which I like also aesthetically. It's nice because it makes this look like a buffer tube, which is cool. Um, so you unscrew these. Well, when you get these, you're going to get three seals with it. I'm going to go up a bunch of things with you. You get three seals with it. One's already in the nozzle, and you get two extra ones. A lot of you out there are having trouble with these seals when you replace them, um, have to having the seal stay in. What you want to do is take your seal be the night before you know you're going to put it in, put some Pelgun oil on it, sit it, and just sit it in a bowl, let it sit aside before you pop it in. Let the, let the Pelgun oil work into that seal. It's a, it's a really good way of keeping your seal inside after you insert it. Let it sit. I say overnight. It doesn't have to be overnight. 12 hours, whatever. Um, just gives it time. And then make sure you always keep a little Pelgon oil on the seal anyhow. It's going gonna, it's gonna to sit. Trust me, it's going to save you a lot of uh, time and effort changing seals if you keep the maintenance on the seals um, well done. And you want to keep the maintenance on the seals good anyhow because, like I just mentioned, your CO2 gases really affect your seals and dry them out quickly. So you want to make sure that you do that. Your seals will last four or five times longer than uh, if you don't. So these are really simple. So you, so you simply take your CO2 canister, um, you drop it in, you screw it on, and what's really great about these, I'm not, now this one's already been pierced, but um, what you do is you get it to where it's tight, you get one quick twist, and it tightens on. Now, don't get paranoid because you're not going to hear it. You're not going to hear it. Not on these ones. These are very efficient. They pierce nicely and you don't lose any CO2, which is a bonus also. Downside to these is you're realistically going to get one full magazine that's usable one, uh, and accurate. One full magazine, 30 rounds, out of one 12 gram CO2 cartridge. Now to a, lot, to a lot of you that's a deal breaker and I understand it. A lot for a lot of you the 88 and 90s are a good idea because you're going to go out and you're going to shoot them all day and, and you're not going to, you know, you're going to use up most of that CO2 so I get that. With me, it's just more cost effective not to do that. But just so you know what you're getting if you do do this, you're going to get 30 rounds. Now, it's been reported up to, up to um, 60 rounds, two magazines, basically, with one of these. Temperature varies, um, you know, that kind of thing. But I will tell you that after 30 rounds, 30 rounds is, is, the, is the golden ratio for this gun. 
um, it starts dropping off dramatically and your foot pounds and your feet are going to drop off dramatically and it's not going to be consistent. You're going to have to start raising your muzzle to hit your target. So if you're looking for accuracy, it's just change it. Just change it. And after the 30 rounds, I mean, it's not even a big blast of CO2 that comes out when you change it. So change it out, put another mag in if you're doing it that way. That's what I would recommend if you're looking for accuracy. And we all want to hit our target for sure. So speaking of targets, how is it on a target? Well, like I mentioned, the conditions yesterday were not exactly ideal for being outside. Very, very cold. I was in knee-deep snow, saturated in knee-deep snow while it was freezing. So it was very uncomfortable, but at the same time it was fun. And hey, what better time to test a product, an air gun, than in a condition that it's really not designed for. Let's see how it does. Well, this did very well. Way beyond my expectations. And I'm impressed with it. Sig Sauer, you hit a home run with the MPX and the MCX. You've hit a home run with these. Now, I'm sure there's bad ones out there. We all get bad ones. As long as we don't hear reports on all of them being bad, or most of them being bad, like we did the Sig Sauer Virtus. That's not, a, that's, not a, that's not good. These, they got it right they are a lot better. Um, so accuracy wise, well, let's just say knee deep snow, pulled back 30 yards, exactly 30 yards, measured it off, and I set up just a made up paper target. Now, I hadn't sighted the gun in yet, so what you're seeing on this target is everything from sighting the gun in, everything, using the supplied Sig Sauer quick sight. And I'm going to use that term loosely. We'll get to that in a second. But what we had, let me get on my spectacles here. Aiming for dead center. First shot was here. Second shot, I don't know what I did. Third was here. Fourth and fifth. Now, once I got into center here, this is just some quick adjustments. In the cold, off the cough, in the cold, adjusting the scope real quick. We started hitting center. Center is three and a half inches. Three and a half inch center. So... What I started hitting here, started grouping it into this section. We got seven, eight, nine, whatever, very close. And then I started drilling in this section right here. Shots 12 through 17 did a, a one inch, less than a one inch spread at 30 yards. 12 through 17, pretty much plugging the same hole right there, okay? Um, I dropped down, hit a target over here. My center target is... Uh, eighth of an inch, about an eighth of an inch center target here, and I was and I was off by an eighth of an inch in the center. <coughs> Come over here, hit the edge of that eighth of an inch target, and I knew I was pretty close. So then I took my time and I went up here to this top target, and I put consistently put, this is 11 shots in a row at 30 yards, and I have, now I put 11, or I'm sorry, I put a half inch spread here is what I wrote. But realistically, because the paper is broken, it's more like a quarter inch. More like a quarter inch spread, realistically. But I put a half inch spread, so we'll, you know, say, say it's a half inch. I'd rather, rather say it's bigger than, than it's smaller, but we'll say a half inch spread up here. That's 11 consistent shots. And basically, it's just breaking apart the paper through the same hole. It's very, very impressive. Now, this is coming from a gun with an 8-inch barrel. An 8-inch barrel. That blew my mind. I didn't expect that in a pellet gun to be that accurate. Now, I've seen reviews of these guns being accurate, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't believe it. There's a guy out there who... He's an expert shooter, and he has the real one, and he picked up one of these to train with. And they're a great training gun. There's no doubt about it. The weight, the heft, the feels right on. Um, he decided he was going to shoot some targets, and he was hitting all his targets. He moved it to 50 yards. He hit all his targets. He moved it to 75 yards. He hit his target. He moved it back to 100 yards. I know it sounds crazy. 100 yards with an 8-inch barrel and hit his target the first time. So how's that possible? Well, 
there's a great equalizer on this gun, and I'll tell you why it's possible. While it doesn't have the feet per second, although I haven't tested the feet per second on this gun, we've all seen those, I'm sure we've all seen those reviews where they have tested the feet per second. What this does have going for it is the barrel. That's the great equalizer. The barrel has to be tight, it has to be straight, it has to be rifled, it has to be consistent. This barrel on this gun has to be awesome for it to achieve those kind of figures. So, while we all, as you know, air gun enthusiasts, we're always looking at feet per second and we're always looking at the foot pounds or the jewels, we sometimes lose track of what's really important and that's the accuracy. What good is any of that? If we don't hit our target. Um, and speaking of that, that's only as good as the ammo we're running. And I gotta tell you, I had a surprise. I mean, I was blindsided by this. And if you know me, you know I run high-end ammo. I'm running H&Ns most of the time. Why? Because they're awesome. I never have a question about it. It's never a crapshoot with an H&N. I know it's going to be good ammo, so I run it. Um, other ammos, not so much, but I like them. I don't endorse them by any means, but I think they're to me, the best manufacturer of pellet gun ammo in the world. My opinion. It was my variant, I understand. We get used to something and, and we like it, but I never have any issues with them. Well, I was in Walmart the other day, and I decided that they just put out a big section of pellets and CO2, and they have nothing. They're out of everything. So there's one, one lone section of pellets and CO2 in this big long gun aisle, it used to be, and there's nothing else there but pellets and CO2, and they, it's freshly stocked, and prices are cheap, so I went up, I went over, and I said, I gotta take a look, and I normally don't buy Crossman ammo, I really normally don't, um, but apparently they came a long ways, and, and, and I'm sure a lot of you out there do use it, and... I'm glad you do because at least this tin that I got was pretty impressive. This is what I ran in this gun, and it wasn't even intentionally that I tested these in this gun. I just happened to load them up because I was curious about the pellet, and I wanted to check out the quality. And from what I found, these things are amazing. These are the um, these are your Crossman Premier Piranha 10.5 grain. And... Wow, was I surprised at how accurate these things are. And I found that that 10.5 grain really seems to suit this gun really well. Um, that's what I was shooting. I wasn't having flyers. I wasn't having, you know, these, these strays that were going all over. So that tells me the consistency of these pellets are pretty good. And these are a lead pellet. So they're soft, but they worked really really well so I ended up picking up those and I picked up a couple of these tins of uh, of the long range penetration um, pointed and they're in a 7.4 grain haven't tried them yet but they were cheap I got these ones for six bucks and these were like four dollars three nine three dollars ninety four cents a, a package for those I picked up those I got some more co2 I stocked up on some more pellets simply even if they were a brand that I'm not used to running I bought them to have them and I'm pleasantly surprised that I did so what's the takeaway on that Hey, give stuff a try. If you don't like it for that price, whatever, you know, put it in your kid's pellet gun. Let them plink away with it. But impressed with the Piranhas. Um, shot really well on this gun. It's an amazing gun. Now, I want to get to the quick sight on this. I wouldn't, I'm going to use that term loosely. Qu quick sight. Quick sight normally means that when you go to find your acquisition through the site, it's very quick. You can put the dot on it, pull the trigger quickly. It means you should be able to look without closing an eye, both eyes open, look down, dot on wall, dot on whatever you're shooting, dot on target, whatever you're shooting at, pull the trigger, it hits with the dots on. This sighted in nice and quickly. But as far as quick sight goes, this is the only downfall of this. And I'm not going to bash this scope because it works and it does maintain and it does serve its purpose, but it's not a quick sight. So when I'm trying to find my target, I should be able to raise up a target and put the dot on it without trying to adjust my face in this direction or up or down to try to find that dot does not happen with this scope. I have to be in a precise precision place every time to even 
get the dot in where I can see it to make it visible to me, to pull the trigger to make it useful. Now, once I do find it and get in the perfect position and I pull the trigger, it's dead on target. It does work. I'm ambidextrous, so I shoot both hands and I'm the same way, okay? But I'm still looking to find it. And that's just not acceptable. Like, even now, I can't tell if it's on because I have to literally get myself in place. I'm going to turn it on here. There we go. See, I'm, now I got it right there. But if I'm here, can't see it if I'm here. Can't see it if I'm here. Can't see I have to be right here perfectly to see that. That's not acceptable. I mean, it's, if you're taking your time with your shots and you can do that, that's fine. But if you want to find your target quickly, which these normally these sites are intended for, it's not good for that. I don't know why it's like that. Um, I think it's something that they kind of just threw on their air guns, maybe. But I'm not gonna. I'm still not bashing the site because it does let you allow you to hit the target and come with the gun. Is it worth an upgrade for this gun? This gun is definitely worth an upgrade for a better optic because the gun's up to par. Now, if the gun wasn't up to par, I'd say leave it and don't worry about it because it's never going to be what it is. This is amazing. Magazine function flawlessly every time, running the piranhas, cycled every time. I had one issue, and that's not the fault of the gun. That was the fault of the atmosphere around me. I had the gun, as you know, as I said, it was cold out. It froze up on me. And what I mean by that is you've probably had this happen to you too, even in warm weather, where your CO2 gets so cold the gun freeze. You can't do nothing. It's locked up. It feels like a jam, but it's not a jam. You froze. Well, a combination of that cold weather where it was freezing out and rapid fire with a CO2 cartridge leads to a frozen gun. Not the fault of the gun. It was me not waiting between trigger pulls. When we started having fun with this. Um, would I expect this to be an issue in warmer weather like that? No, this actually did really, really well. That happened once to me during the whole time of testing. It happened once in 200 rounds. Um, once it unfroze, which was literally pulling the charging handle back, giving it a shake, letting it sit for a couple of seconds, maybe 30 seconds, and we were right back in action again. So, <coughs> yeah, it worked out good can't say enough about this. This is a hit for sure. If you've been thinking about buying one, you won't be disappointed at all. At all. And if you want something with more feet per second, which I'm going to get into with you here in a minute, um, then you want to go with the MCX because it has a longer barrel. It gives you a little more feet per second, a little more energy. I wanted something short and stubby, and this fit the bill, and I'm happy with the power and the accuracy out of this the way it is. And that was in the extreme cold, so I can imagine what it's going to be when it warms up. Um, yeah, I'm impressed. Now I'm going to touch on a little bit of a subject because we all forget from time to time. We get wrapped up in... Um, I don't mean to go on rants, but I like to talk about things because it's it's on my mind and a lot. I, I'm guilty of this too, just so you know. I'm, I'm totally guilty of what I'm about to say. We'll go online and we'll look at a gun. And the first thing that we do is we look at the feet per second. We do it every time. I'm guilty. What's the feet per second? Oh, wow. Because our eyes get big. Holy shit, look at that. <coughs> And I'm going to give you another example of what we do. If we're shopping for a car, if you're like me, I'm into hot rods, I build hot rods. We're always looking at that horsepower figure. Well, I don't do that now. I usually do that when I was a kid. Just like, just like a car, we're looking at the wrong number. We don't want to look at feet per second. Feet per second's a byproduct. Keep that in the back of your mind. It's a byproduct of the foot-pounds that the gun is putting out. So it's not, the, it's not that I say, it's, I, I guess not even a byproduct is the right word. If we're shopping for a car and we want a fast car, we automatically look at the horsepower figures. That's how fast, that's, horsepower is what makes a car go fast, but we always forget at what propels that car, what gets that car moving, and that's the torque. 
So we're going to apply that over to our air gun world, okay? In a gun, it's not the feet per second. What gets that pellet moving is the energy that it puts out. What's the foot pounds? What's the joules? It's the energy. Energy is the equivalent to torque, and the feet per second is the equivalent to the horsepower. So what's the most important number? Well, it's the energy that the, put gun, the gun puts out. How efficient is it? It's efficiency. So if we have a balls-ass bunch of energy coming out, the feet per second will follow. But it's not as an important of a number. Where, But if we can get a gun that has... So in a car, in a hot rod world, I'm going to keep going back to this, if you have a horsepower number that works really well and runs with the curve and you see this on dynos, if you see them on dyno, they want that horsepower and torque curve to run really well with each other. They want it, you know linear and then run right with each other that means you're getting the maximum out of it well we want the same thing in an air gun we want the feet per second okay which horsepower and we want our foot pounds torque to run with each other i'll give you a good example brick barrel got a brick barrel gun and it shoots 1300 feet per second okay that 1300 feet per second doesn't mean anything if you don't have the foot pounds to go with it, you follow what I'm saying? Um, and you've all found that out. Look at the what happens to the accuracy. So if you've got a car with gobs of horsepower and no torque, it's slow. Because it doesn't have the, the torque to push it. That's why your big trucks have a lot of torque. Pull down a house has that torque, monster torque. Same thing, we need foot pounds. We need usable energy, okay? And then we can manip manipulate the gun inside to create our feet per second, also known as, in the car world, horsepower. And I'm trying to use these analogies because it's something that I'm very familiar with, okay? So when we look at numbers, and like I said, I'm guilty of this, when I look at numbers... We look at feet per second. I don't care. I've learned not to care about the feet per second. What I'm looking at is how efficient How efficient is that gun? Is it usable? Okay. So if we have a gun that's shooting at, well, we'll let's say 14 foot pounds like the Virtus is supposed to be shooting at. Okay. We have to figure out how it's making that foot pounds. Are we, it's the energy is what we're concerned with. Okay. But how efficient is the energy? What makes the energy efficient? Well, on a gun, it's the barrel. That barrel, how is it transferring? We have to transfer it. Just like a car, we have to transfer that, that horsepower and torque to the ground, to those rear wheels to hit the road. How much of that is getting lost through the drivetrain? Well, just like a gun, how much of that is getting lost through the build quality of the gun? This is where your barrel comes in, okay? The barrel is going to tell you how it's going to transfer that energy. Make sense? So if you have an awesome, that's where the key is, if you have an awesome barrel, you're not losing air in your chamber, and, you, and it's efficiently projecting the air through the chamber, down the barrel, and out the end, that's going to equate into the maximum that you can get by that gun. How efficient is that gun? Power of the gun is going to be how the gun is, is what the gun is, what's the, what's the build quality of the gun, how efficient is the gun made inside, just like a car, how efficient is the transmission, what's it running for a ratio for a gears, it's, it all crosses over, it's, I'm just using different terminology because a lot of you are into cars and you'll understand it better that way. So basically if we've got a good barrel, I'm just going to use a bit, as many other things we could point to in an, in an air rifle or a CO2 rifle. But if we got a good barrel, that's a really, really good place to start. If we're losing energy someplace, most of the time it's in the barrel because it's not a tight seat in the barrel. And that's important. That's important. Or it's it, we need perfection in a barrel to produce um, consistent results. And that's important too because consistency gives us tight groups and accuracy. And without accuracy... None of anything that I just mentioned means anything if you can't hit your target. So I hope this helps 
you understand what we're really looking at in the gun world. So don't pay attention so much, because I get that a lot in comments. Well, the feet per second are this. I don't care. What I care about is what consistent foot pounds it puts out, consistent foot pounds, and is it accurate? Because if I have a gun that shoots um, 40 foot pounds and I can't hit my target, it's of no use. If I have a gun that's shooting 8 foot pounds and I can hit my target, at least it's of use. It's hitting something. 14 foot pounds means nothing to me. It's like having a top fuel dragster, okay, that can't make it down the track. It serves no purpose. I'd rather be in a street car that can cover the quarter mile. Make sense? All right, guys. If you like this video, hit like, subscribe, share. Don't forget to hit that notification bell. And